in just a few moments, we'll move on to the next presentation and the final one for this afternoon. Uh, Tom Phelps is going to be presenting IE, his new Apple II emulator that performs animated software visualizations and time travel. After that, we will meet down here at 5.15 for our pizza party. It'll be a little bit hectic since we only have 15 minutes to set up, so I would appreciate help uh, moving tables around and getting the pizza set up. All right, so nowadays we all enjoy a, a large number of emulators for the Apple II. We've got them for all the major platforms. We've got emulators that emulate a, a wide range of hardware, and it's good times because any individual wants to run some software from back in the day. We've got an emulator that will handle that. We've got emulators for digital preservation. And so that's, uh, that's terrific to have. And when I run an emulator on my iMac at home, I've got a 2.8 gigahertz machine with four cores and 32 gigabytes of memory. And running an Apple II emulator takes about 10% of the CPU of one core. And so now that we have our, our individual needs and, and digital preservation needs satisfied, one could ask, what could we do now with this enormous power of our computers while running software from back in the day? Can we do something that we couldn't do in 1985 with a fully loaded machine? And so I've been writing this emulator, and I have a few ideas, and I'd like to show them to you. Okay, so to prove that it is an Apple II emulator, we'll have, we'll have a scheduled 60 seconds of Choplifter. Oh. See, so I have the joystick so I can shoot tanks and the guys enter the Choplifter. So we can head back. We sit down at the post office and they, they wave at you as you go into the post office as we fall seen. Okay, and now I head back for a second round and a jet airplane comes and shoots me to the ground. Okay, so I will pause this now. Okay, so I think that jet fighter was a sneak attack because I was... I was just trying to rescue my guys. And so uh, with a uh, modern computer in my emulator, you can pause it and you can play the game backwards. So here I was crashed. I lift up from the dead. Here comes a jet fighter and he goes away. And this is not a video because I can now restart the game at that point. And see, there's the jet fighter and I go, ha, ha, ha. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you can always just restart. And uh, your full history is uh, available, so you can actually go farther and farther back to. Oops. Okay. So we can go back before we restarted. And. We can say, have the people come out of the heli the post office. And, and as it turns out, they, you thought the, the guys were waving at you. One guy was giving you the finger. So you say, all right, everyone back in the helicopter. We're going back into enemy territory. OK, everyone out of the helicopter. All right. so. Uh, so this just shows you for one game, but this could run for any game, and you know, you could, uh, you know, if, if you, nowadays you think uh, you just want to play the game for fun and see what's in the next level, or you know, th this is for that. Or I mean, you can obviously use it for, you know, wizardry or something. You have a big boss battle, and you say, oh, actually, all my men have died, but I just want to have fun. I don't want to go through and regenerate men and things. So it can do that. Uh, so how does this work? So. What's happening is that the emulator is 10 times a second capturing the entire memory state of the computer. And for this, it's 48K plus all of the switches on page C0. 
and it just stashes that away. It just makes a copy, and because that's everything you need to, to record this date. And uh, at 10 times a second, that gives you kind of the animation you want when you play it backwards. And this is uh, was would be crazy back in the day because it, you know people the first computers uh, Apple II's only had 4K, and 48K was finally something which you could afford. But now we're doing 10 times a second full 48K. Uh, but for a modern computer, this is nothing. So 48K, 10 times a second, well, that's under half a megabyte per second. See, for 10 seconds, that's 5 megabytes. For a minute, well, it multiplies out. And so for an hour, it takes about less than 2 gigabytes of memory. And my computer has 32 gigabytes. My next one's going to have 64. So it's just totally reasonable. And this is at 10 times a second. So maybe you could lower the cost of uh, memory cost and say, well, after 15 minutes, I only need one second resolution. And that would reduce your cost by a factor of 10. So for today's machine, this is a totally reasonable thing to do. All right. So that's uh, one tool. I'll, I'll be showing three tools. OK. And this. Uh, Emulator is under development, so I'm just launching everything from the command line. Okay. And I set fast disk mode. Okay. Uh, all right, so we'll this is flight simulator, and we'll set the speed to a transwarp 2 just to get it doing interesting things. All right, so uh, as we're familiar, a lot of games use this technique called two-page animation to get smooth animation. Uh, so what you do is you draw everything. You have, you have two high-res pages, and you can switch between them instantly. And so while you're showing one page, you do all your erase and redraw and everything you need to do on the hidden page and then you switch back and instantly it looks like you have a clean animation. And another technique you need to use is you need to just update a partial portion of the screen at a time because at a 1 megahertz C, uh, 6502 CPU you don't have time to update the entire screen and get a good frame rate. And so I just told you that in words but I can actually show you what's going on because I can bring up uh, a second monitor. And I can set the second monitor to opposite mode. So what this is doing is when the, when the main window is showing one page, the hidden page should set the opposite one. So if the main page is showing high-res page one, this other one down in the corner is showing this page two. And when the double page animation switches, so the main page shows this page two, the hidden page shows page one, and you can see things as it's drawn. And it should help we fly into interesting territory. And we can s slow down the computer to one quarter megahertz or slow mo, and you can and you can see things as they're drawn. And so you can see it's he's actually very inefficient because he's usually you're trying to do all you can to update a machine or uh, an area of the screen as fast as you can but he's inefficient because he's drawing a large portion of the screen in the green rectangle and overdrawing it and then with that purple rectangle and so that's uh, kind of a surprising thing that you would never know unless you have this crazy mode that shows you behind the screen which you would never seen before Okay. All right, and let me show you a second screen working on on uh, a different piece of software.
right, so I don't know how to play this game, but that's okay, because this is your main play screen, and I guess you move your little guy around, and you go into different rooms, and, uh, let's see. Oh, I died, okay. But what's weird about this game is that if we bring up uh, the second monitor, and set that to opposite. Okay, so this is opposite text, which is not interesting, but if we go back and hit the graphics, then look at what's happening. So this, th uh, did I die? I died immediately. I have to restart this because uh, I'm in the death spiral here. Okay, so. All right, so up there, the little, uh, that's a play area, and this is the hidden screen. And for some reason, there's animation going on in the hidden screen. Here we are, we're on a one megahertz processor trying everything we can do to animate the main screen, and we're wasting all of the cycles on this hidden screen. So it's weird, okay. So I, I, I kind of like lead the, these things on while I play different games on this uh, emulator and just sometimes strange things happen. Okay. So this is a uh, snake bite, and this uh, this game is high res, but it kind of looks like low res. I mean, it has a very chunky shapes, and in fact, uh, if we bring up our new monitor and we can set it to show us the low res screen. Yeah, so here's, here's low res, and you can see that it's exactly matching the high res screen. So the, the snake goes down, it's the green, it goes right, it's red, up, blue. And in fact, this is uh, exactly how the author wrote it. So in uh, John Romero's podcast, which is up to episode two now, <laughs> the next one's due, I think, in 2020. But in episode two, he interviewed the author of Snake Bite, Chuck Somerville, and uh, Chuck said that he actually has like used the low res mode because it had a screen uh, collision detection, and so he, he uses it for that. But then he actually shows the high res version because that looks better, so we can actually see that happening. All right. Uh, so uh, by the way, so my talk is. Is, has zero PowerPoint slides. It's all action demos. Okay. All right, I'll show you uh, one more example of this. Oops. Okay, so this is a game called Grapple. Uh, your, your guy up on the, the left moves up and down to these various levels, and you shoot the monsters that come at you, and you shoot them back, and when they get to this right side, they fall into the gutter. And uh, actually, this has gone too far, so I have to go back a little bit. Uh, I want to move these guys back. Okay. So it's, it's helpful in other ways. Okay, and what I want to show is that if we 
look now on the text page. like an exact parallel in the text page. <coughs> so you have the levels, you have the monsters moving across the screen, you've got a guy up there, and in fact, it appears uh, I've done no disassembly, I've done nothing but run this uh, text mode on it, but it appears that this game was implemented by using a high-res character generator, and so he's, he can use like H-tab and V-tab and draw these, these characters, and he gets a high-res game out of it. Like defines a new font for each level, and uh, so if you, you might not have to be uh, no assembly language or anything, and you can get this uh, high-res game out of it. So, so that's something I didn't know. All right, let me show you now the third and final tool. In his talk yesterday, uh, Peter Ferry told us about the boot, told us in words about the boot process of sneakers and how there's a little animation going on and how he replicated that in his crack. And I will uh, be able to show you then the, the, uh, the boot of sneakers from an EDD rip. Okay, see, so you, you can see the guy stomping there. All right. And let me now bring up this very strange looking thing. All right. So I'll stop this and, uh, and discuss this for a minute. So what this, uh, this very geometric looking thing over here kind of looks like uh, a piece of modern art, of abstract art. Maybe it's a Mark, Thro Mark Rothko. This is actually showing you the entire memory of the computer. So 10 times a second, it scans all 65,536 memory locations and, and shows you a visualization of them. And uh, it's, uh, it looks a bit, uh, and once you, can, uh, once you understand how to read the information there, you can tell a lot about a program without disassembling it, without doing anything. And so what we have, uh, let me tell you how to read it. So, uh, memory locations that have been written more recently than something else are in red. Those that have been read are in green, and those ha that have execution are in blue. And so, and we memory is generally linear. Uh, the most common thing is you have a bar all the way across that's a, a page, 256 bytes. Uh, however, the, it's specialized. Up in here is the text page, it only, and it's, it's molded to, to match the weird memory mapping of the text page. High res is also shaped to parallel the high res screen. And I will just let this run. And, and you can see the guys coming down. And if it's the things that are most recently writ, read or written or executed are in a brighter color, and so. Uh, you can see like the animation here is that they first draw it on the screen and then as it comes down to the screen it, you read it from above and that the code that's running this animation is here in high res page 2 um, and, and down in here this, this red area which isn't, hasn't been only been read or a bit only been written that, that's the uh, D0 this is at an Applesoft area and this down here is the, the monitor and you can, uh, you can see this is a, uh, a binary game, so it doesn't really have any use for AppleSoft, except that there's this, 
you have this this uh, this, this, this area down here that's being executed a little bit. So what is this? Well, not only do you see it, but you can move your mouse over any part of the screen here, and it will tell you what that memory location is. And uh, if it's executable code, it'll give you a one-line disassembly. And if it's flashing yellow, that means that's actually being executed at that time. And so we, uh, we can see it's FCA8, that this area this we just found here. And that's actually the system weight routine. You, you, I think you send uh, the amount of time you want to wait in the accumulator, and it'll wait a few milliseconds like that. And so uh, that's kind of surprising when we were we were scanned the entire memory, found some oddity, pointed the cursor there, it told us the, uh, the address, we were able to do a quick disassembly and figure out what's going on there. All right, so, so the sneakers is kind of a typical game when you have, where you have like a high res, you have not too much code running, and mostly it's green. So this, this bright green are shapes probably that have been written on the screen, and uh, this will be our model, and I'll show you some other uh, examples that are variations here. You said that was running from an EDD? Right. Right, and the, so the EDD has a 4 and 4 encoding and, and half tracks. Uh, so is this based on open emulator code, though? No, this is from scratch. Uh, because uh, that's more fun to do. <laughs> All right? All right, now uh, let me show you something from the other extreme. Uh, this probably pushes the computer, uh, the, you know, one megahertz as far as it goes. All right, so this is Earhart. Oh, I need to, uh, okay. Screw that up. Nope, I don't want that. Uh, all right, now, Earhart uh, uh, is a, a double high res game, so it uses main and auxiliary high res. It's a double, it uses page flipping, so it uses the, uh, you know, four full high-res screens in total. You can see this is red, it's, it's updated all the time. The more recent updates are in the bright color, the older ones are in the darker color. And you see this flashing going back and forth? That's, uh, you're seeing auxiliary memory. So this 6502 can only address 64K at a time, and there's funky switches to let you access more memory, like auxiliary memory, the second, which is the second bank of 64K. And the, this visualization always uses the most current switches, uh, memory switches, and shows you what the active 64K is. And so when it flashes back and forth, you see it's switching between this blue, which is executing code, and this green, which are shapes, probably. Uh, and so, uh, compared to sneakers, which used one high-res page and a little bit of code, Earhart here is using both high-res pages, um, both main and auxiliary. It's got, look, at, I mean, the, in the last, uh, in a, recently it's using a huge amount of uh, uh, executable code, plus it's, it's using bank switch memory, so it's switching out AppleSoft and using this area for memory, uh, and it's just really pushing everything as far as you can go. Okay, so can I go to five after since we had a late start? Yeah. Okay, all right, so I, I'll show you uh, a few more minutes of demos. All right. Um, all right, I'll show you why, one reason why BASIC is so slow. So. All right, so this is, um, familiar program. And it, it does have sound, but apparently the, I don't have the volume turned up on the Mac. Uh, okay, so remember in 
sneakers, we had a little bit of blue code that was executing and the rest was blank. But here is basic, a basic program running. Here's AppleSoft down at the bottom in this blue area. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the machine code that's running AppleSoft. And this is our basic program in here, through here, down here. And you notice it's not blue, it's not executing. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of green in here, and there's some more brighter green dots, and the rest of it is just red, which means we wrote the program into memory. Uh, and this is actually what an interpreted program looks like, because uh, the AppleSoft down here reads and makes green the Apple, uh, your, our program, and then I'm going to pause this. Uh, and so it, it never actually executes as far as the CPU is concerned. Now, you notice in here, like this green area, we have bright, you know, we have blank here, we have some green stuff, and we have these blank areas, and like especially in here, there's, there's some green dots in there. This is uh, how AppleSoft does the go subs and go twos. So when it has a, a go sub or go to, it has to search through the program for that, and it can go from start of line to start of line. And so there you see this hopping through, looking for some line number toward the end of the program. Uh, and uh, let me show you why AppleSoft is so, or one visualization of why it's so slow. All right, so in the program, it's, it asks, are you starting a new game, yes or no? And this is a, a simple question, and it's just kind of very basic. It's not executing much code, but watch what AppleSoft does to for this very simple input. Look at this, look at huge amount of AppleSoft lit up and all I did was type in no for a, an input. It evaluates everything in the most general way. All right, and I probably, uh, I'll show you one more and then uh, I don't wanna keep people away from the pizza. All right, here's another program that uh, uh, okay, here's an Infocom adventure, and this disk, and yes, all right, all right. Now, you may or may not know that, but Infocom games are also interpreted. So Infocom was able to generate this uh, platform cross-platform uh, development system, and they would generate your code in this byte code. It's like Java byte code. It's kind of a generic thing that you can send out. And then for every computer that they supported, they had an interpreter written in binary. And we can see this in operation. Uh, it's just like basic, only a little more sophisticated. So here's the interpreter with the blue stuff up here. And here's kind of a, a your I.O. buffer, and then this red area is programmed with red in. And now I will type some commands and you can see how the, so now watch for the blue area to light up, but the program area in red will, uh, will turn green in some places. See, so the bright, bright blue, and then it's kind of red code from this area and from in here. And so, okay, so uh, we're coming to time, so I just want to leave with uh, a lanyap, just one extra thing. We'll take one second. And now, uh, of course, a text adventure doesn't have pictures, and you use your imagination, and so they're timeless. But still, if you look at the, our, uh, our game here, it kind of looks like a business letter. I mean, or I'm typing in like a word processor that tells me my paragraph and character number, you know, here's the return address I typed in, and you know, dear sir, your product does not work, I hate you, and signed, you know, so on down here. And we can actually enhance this a little bit. Uh, because it's an, an emulator, we have full uh, freedom to swap out anything that we want at any time. And so I want to swap in a font from the DOS toolkit from 1980 <coughs> that looks like a little space font for our space game. And that's just a little flavor. All right, thank you.
Chris Torrance. Was you going to uh, yeah. So it uh, is in. This was a technology demonstration today, and I have uh, uh, jumped over some of the boring things to get to the good stuff that I wanted to do. And I need to go back and uh, implement the boring but necessary parts of an emulator and uh, make things more robust before we can look at that. <laughs> I, I want to I want to get a slot on Assembly Lines video podcast someday. Absolutely. Okay, that's it. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Uh, are you running just one core? Yeah. Yeah. So single thread. Be able to use another core for data reduction to capture a few seconds of your capture. Uh, yes. It's that. Uh, yes. Start compressing them because most of it's like That's right. Yeah. There are all kinds of tricks for data reduction. It's like. Doing it the this, this brute force way is pretty good because computers are so powerful and have so much memory, but there are lots of ways to be clever too. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, someone is uh, yes. Uh, could you increase the capture rate from 10 frames per second to 100 frames per second? Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.